Carrie, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Carrie, you're focusing on diabetic retinopathy. Why is that an issue of concern for you all? Well, it's a large problem, uh, is number one with that. You know, approximately 30% of patients with you know, type 2 diabetes develop it. And for those with type 1, around 80% of them eventually develop it. And while there are some very good treatments available for the complications of diabetic retinopathy, such as DME or diabetic macular edema, because they're intravitreal or invasive procedures, they're not applied earlier in the disease process. So what we're looking at are the group who are still maybe have moderately severe to severe diabetic retinopathy, but do not yet have a complication. So our treatment, OTT-166, is an eye drop that can be administered non-invasively to improve the health of the retina, but also, more importantly, perhaps, prevent or delay the progression to a vision-threatening complication, such as diabetic macular edema or increase in vascularization leading to PDR and, and other um, complications. Well, you know, when I came across your company, Occutera Therapeutics, I was fascinated because we're talking about essentially just an eye drop, right? Which, you know, can work through its method in order to treat uh, diabetic retinopathy when right now we're mostly just using surgical methods. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, in this case, you know, uh, it may appear just a simple eye drop, but it's a very special molecule, I like to say the magics in the molecule here, that it was designed specifically to have the characteristics that allows it to go through the tissues of the eye to reach the retina. And interestingly, it goes via what is called a transscleral route. So it mm. goes and soaks in from around the outside and gets into the retina. It's not like it has to work all its way back from the front. Right. So transscleral distribution to the retina is a known potential route. And some drugs, a couple of drugs, can do that. So 166, the molecule, was designed to have the characteristics to enable it to do that. That's fascinating because, of course, we know about, you know, the ocular penetration issues of antibiotics or essentially things that are for front of the eye, conditions such as that. And even then, you know, it can be challenging. So you've got a special challenge getting into the back of the eye. Yes, we have. But um, we believe there's uh, strong evidence to show that we've overcome that. So uh, OTT-166 was uh, tested. Its first in human trials were in patients with diabetic retinopathy who had already diabetic macular edema. And we were able to show biological activity in that, that not only does the drug get to the retina, but it has a biological effect when it gets there. Now, this is also an interesting issue to me because in another area of ocular pathology, glaucoma, uh, there's the term MIGS, or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And there, it seems like the trend is moving from drops to minimally invasive surgical methods. Whereas here, in this diabetic retinopathy space, we're talking about moving from surgery to drops. So why is one field going in one direction and another field going in this direction? I think it represents perhaps a maturity difference in the field. So for many, many years, glaucoma has been treated by drops. And now in order to improve delivery or make it more convenient, you know, some things like MIGS, et cetera, or resistant uh, patients. Whereas in diabetic retinopathy, there's really nothing available for the patient groups and, you know, that we're looking at and until it progresses to a, a severe you know, sight-threatening complication. You know, the standard of care for patients until they have a DME, et cetera, is active surveillance or essentially watch and wait. So, you know, an eye drop treatment available for this patient group is in fact revolutionary. You know, the first time you can move from um, watch and wait or, act, or active surveillance to active treatment and do something about the disease progression. Do you think compliance issues would be similar in the area of glaucoma uh, as well as in diabetic retinopathy? Or would patients be more uh, adhering to therapies in this area because perhaps they're more noticeably losing vision? Um, this is something we looked at, and we've talked certainly with you know uh, eye care providers about this and, and considered the situation. So there's a big difference here. When you're looking at patients who have glaucoma, they're not symptomatic, and it's some 
a problem with their vision that's many, many years off. And so, yeah, it's a little harder to be motivated uh, with that. But with patients with diabetic retinopathy, the nearer term problem of impact on their vision, and perhaps more importantly for patients, the potential to need to be treated with intravitreal injections is a bigger motivator for patients to comply with their therapy. So we don't see that this is going to be a major problem uh, for our patient group. The field is pretty diverse here as well. Um, would you say that these methods uh, in terms of your molecule or, or drops could also apply to the age-related macular degeneration space? Um, yes, there is potential there as well. You know, the way the, the molecule works is a selective integrin inhibitor. And we know that the, me the mechanism of action of this particular integrin inhibition actually works by cutting off the signaling from the VEGFR2 receptor. It also cuts off signaling of several other growth factor receptors. So we know that anti-VEGF works in AMD patients and essentially, you know, integrin is sort of like anti-VEGF plus. So there is potential for it to be used in other situations such as AMD, yes. And Carrie, when would you say this is perhaps likely to become commercially available? Well, we're a little way off yet. We're just starting our phase two trial. We'll be dosing our first patient this quarter uh, in the phase two trial, and we're expecting top line results from that proof of concept trial in the early part of 2024. So it's a little way off yet, but moving forward with a, a very good, solid phase two study now. And the future of the company, is this something likely to potentially be acquired, or are you looking to build the company out further? So my philosophy is, move forward to build out the company going forward. If along the way, someone, uh, a group pr presents a compelling offer for an acquisition, then that's something that would be considered, not only in light of the economics of what's on offer, but also a group that may be able to bring more resources to move more quickly and more effectively to bring OTT 166 to patients. So we'll wait and see. Carrie, I'd be remiss without asking, what markets around the world would you envision this for uh, perhaps earlier on and then even later on? Mm -hmm. so, so the problem for diabetic retinopathy is actually growing worldwide. It's not just a sort of U.S., European affluent uh, country. If you look at the countries where there's increasing rates of diabetes, you know, China, India, you know, other parts of the world, you know, as uh, people drink more Coca-Cola and things like that. Um, it's a growing problem. So there's many aspects, many parts of the world where this is applicable. I think particularly in areas where there perhaps is less access to, to retinal surgeons and retinal specialists. So if you're able to intervene earlier with a non-invasive eye drop, perhaps you can slow down there the progression for patients as well, given that they would find difficulty getting to a retinal surgeon or, or somebody for an intravitreal injection. So many parts of the world, we think this would be applicable. Eye drops for diabetic retinopathy. It's just fascinating to discuss it. Thanks so much for joining us on the program today, Carrie. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.